Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March and this is not your mother's story time. This week we bring you another story by Susan Glaspell, Government Goat. Although Glaspell is known for her feminist work, this story is told from the perspective of a displaced male in American society. When listening to the story, you can see how things haven't changed much since her time. Glassbell was raised to value hard work on a farm in rural Davenport, Iowa. She often wrote about being worthy inheritors of the land and was greatly influenced by the writings of Black Hawk, the Native American sock chief on whose farmland she was raised. Perhaps in his writing, she saw firsthand what a displaced male looks like. And now, Government Goat by Susan Glassbell. Joe Doan couldn't get to sleep. On one side of him, a family were crying because their man was dead, and on the other side, a man was celebrating because he was alive. When he couldn't any longer stand the wails of the Kadaras, Joe moved from his bedroom to the lounge in the sitting room. But the lounge in the sitting room, besides making his neck go, in a way no neck wants to go, brought him too close to Ignis Silva's rejoicings in not having been in one of the dories that turned over when the schooner Lily Benny was caught in the squall last Tuesday afternoon and unable to gather all her men back from the dories before the sea gathered them. Joe Kadara was in a boat that hadn't made it, hence the whales to the left of the Doneses, for Joe Kadara left a wife and four children, and they had plenty of friends who could cry too. But Ignis Silva, more's the pity for at two o'clock in the morning you like to wish the person who was keeping you awake was dead, got back to the vessel. So tonight his friends were there with bottles, for when a man might be dead, certainly the least you can do is to take notice of him by getting him drunk. People weren't sleeping in Cape's End that night. Those who were neither mourning nor rejoicing were being kept awake by mourners or rejoicers. All the vile, diluted whiskey that could be bought on the quiet was in use for the deadening or the heightening of emotion. Joe Doan found himself wishing he had a drink. He'd like to stop thinking about dead fishermen and hearing live ones. Everyone had been all strung up for two days ever since the word came from Boston that the Lily Benny was one of the boats caught. They didn't know until the Lily Benny came in that afternoon just how many of her men she was bringing back with her. They were all out on Long Wharf to watch her come in and to see who would come ashore, and who wouldn't. Women were there and lots of children. Some of these sets of women and children went away with a man, holding on to him and laughing, or perhaps looking foolish to think they had ever supposed he could be dead. Others went away as they had come, maybe very still, maybe crying. There were old men who came away carrying things that had belonged to sons who weren't coming ashore. It was all a good deal like a movie, only it didn't rest you. So he needed sleep, he petulantly told things as he rubbed the back of his neck, wondered why lounges were made like that, and turned over. But instead of sleeping, he thought about Joe Kadara. They were friendly thoughts he had about Joe Kadara, much more friendly than the thoughts he was having about Ignis Silva. For one thing, Joe wasn't making any noise. Even when he was alive, Joe had made little noise. He always had his job on a vessel. He'd come up the front street in his oil skins, turn in at his little red house, come out after a while and hoe in the garden or patch his woodshed, sit out on the wharf and listen to what Ignis Silva and other loud-mouthed Portuguese had to say, back to his little red house. He, well, he was a good deal like the sea. It came in, it went out. On Joe Kadara's last trip in, Joe Doan met him just as he was starting out. Well, Joe, said Joe Doan, off again. Off again, said Joe Kadara. And that was about all there seemed to be to it. He could see him going down the street, short, stocky, slow, dumb. By dumb, he meant, oh, dumb like the sea was dumb, just going on doing it. And now, 
All of a sudden, he couldn't stand Ignis Silva. Hell, roared Joe Doan from the window. Don't you know a man's dead? In an instant, the only thing you could hear was the sea. In, out. Then he went back to his bedroom. I'm not sleeping either, said his wife. The way people are quick to make it plain, they're as bad off as the next one. At first, it seemed to be still at the Gadaras. The children had gone to sleep, so had the friends. Only one sound now where there had been many before, and that seemed to come out of the sea. You got it after a wave broke, as it was dying out. In that little let-up between in and out, you knew that Mrs. Kadara had not gone to sleep. You knew that Mrs. Kadara was crying, because Joe Kadara was dead in the sea. So Joan Dung and his wife Mary lay there and listened to Annie Kadara crying for her husband, Joe Kadara. Finally, Mrs. Doan raised her pillow and sighed. Well, I suppose she wonders what she'll do now, those four children. He could see Joe Kadar's back going down the front street, broad, slow, dumb. And I suppose, he said, as if speaking for something that had perhaps never spoken for itself, that she feels bad because she'll never see him again. Why, of course she does said his wife impatiently, as if he had contradicted something she had said. But after usurping his thought, she went right back to her own. I don't see how she'll get along. I suppose we'll have to help them some. Joe Doan lay there still. He couldn't help anybody much. More was the pity. He had his own three children. And you could be a Doan without having money to help with, though some people didn't get that through their heads. Things used to be different with the Doneses. When the tide's in and you awake at three in the morning, it all gets a good deal like the sea. At least with Joe Doan it did now. His grandfather, Ebenezer Doan, the whaling captain. In, out. Silas Doan, a fleet of vessels off the Grand Banks. In, out. All the Doneses. They had helped make the Cape, but... In, out out. Suddenly Joe laughed. What are you laughing at? demanded his wife. I was just laughing, said Joe, to think what those old Doneses would say if they could see us. Well, it's not anything to laugh at, said Mrs. Done. Why, I think it is, good-humouredly insisted her husband. It's such a joke on them. If it's a joke, said Mrs. Done firmly, it's not on them. He wasn't sure just who the joke was on. He lay thinking about it. At three in the morning, when you can't sleep and the tide's in, you might get it mixed, who the joke was on. But, no, the joke was on them, that they'd had their long, slow, deep in, out, their wailing in their fleets, and that what came after was him, a tinkerer with other men's boats, a ship's carpenter who'd even work on houses, Get Joe Doan to do it for you. And glad enough was Joe Doan to do it, and a portigee living to either side of him. He laughed. You've got a funny idea of what's a joke, his wife said indignantly. That seemed to be so. Things he saw as jokes weren't jokes to anybody else. Maybe that was why he sometimes seemed to be all by himself. He was beginning to get lost in an in-out Faintly he could hear Mrs. Kadara crying. Joe Kadara was in the sea, and faintly he heard his wife saying, I suppose Agnes Kadara could wear Murdy's shoes, only the way things are, seems Murdy's got to wear out her own shoes. Next day when he came home at noon, he was at work then helping Ed Davis put a new coat on Still's store. He found his two boys, the boys were younger than Murdy, pressed against the picket fence that separated Doan's from Kadara's. "'What are those kids up to?' he asked his wife while he washed up for dinner. "'Oh, they just want to see,' she answered, speaking into the oven. "'See what?' he demanded. But this Mrs. Doan regarded as either too obvious or too difficult to answer. So he went to the door and called, "'Joe? Edgar? What are you kids rubbering at?' he demanded. Young Joe dug with his toe. The Kadars have got a lot of company, said he. They're crying, 
triumphantly announced the younger and more truthful Edgar. Well, suppose they are. They got a right to cry in their own house, ain't they? Let the Kadars be. Find some fun at home. The boys didn't think this funny, nor did Mrs. Doan, but the father was chuckling to himself as they sat down to their baked flounder. But to let the Kadars be and find some fun at home became harder and harder to do. The Lily Benny had lost her men in early summer, and the town was as full of summer folk as the harbor was of whiting. There had never been a great deal for summer folk to do in Cape's End, and so the disaster was no disaster to the summer's entertainment. In other words, summer folk called upon the Kadaras. The young Doneses spent much of their time against the picket fence. Sometimes young Kadaras would come out and graciously enlighten them. A woman, she brought my mother a black dress. Or, a lady and two little boys came in automobile and brought me a kitty car and white pants. One day, Joan Doan came home from work and found his youngest child crying because Tony Kadara wouldn't lend him the kitty car. This was a reversal of things. Heretofore, Kadaras had cried for the belongings of the Doneses. Joe laughed about it and told Edgar to cheer up, and maybe he'd have a kitty car himself some day. Meanwhile, he had a paw. Agnes, Kadara, and Mertie Doan were about of an age. They were in the same class in high school. One day, when Joe Doan was pulling in his dory after being out doing some repairs on the Lily Benny, he saw a beautiful young lady standing on the Kadara's bulkhead. Her back was to him, but you were sure she was beautiful. She had the look of someone from away, but not like the usual run of summer folk. Mertie was standing, looking over at this distinguished person. "'Who's that?' Joe asked her. "'Why?' said Mertie in an awed whisper. "'It's Agnes Kadara in her mourning.' Until she turned around, he wouldn't believe it. Well, said he to Murdy, it's a pity more women haven't got something to mourn about. Yes, breathed Murdy. Isn't she wonderful? Agnes's mourning had been given her by young Mrs. McCrae, who lived up on the hill, and was herself just finishing mourning. It seemed Mrs. McCrae and Agnes were built a good deal alike, though you would never have suspected it before Agnes began to mourn. Mrs. McCrae was from New York, and these clothes had been made by a woman Mrs. McCrae called by her first name. Well, maybe she was a woman you'd call by her first name, but she certainly did have a way of making you look as if you weren't native to the place you were born in. Before Agnes Kadara had anything to mourn about, she was simply one of those good-looking Portuguese girls. There were too many of them in Cape's End to get excited about any of them. One day he heard some women on the beach talking about how these clothes had found Agnes, as if she had been lost. Mrs. McCrae showed Agnes how to do her hair in a way that went with her clothes. One noon, when Joe got home early because it rained and he couldn't paint, when he went upstairs he saw Myrtle trying to do this to her hair. Well, it just couldn't be done to Myrtle's hair. Myrtle didn't have hair you could do what you pleased with. She was all red in the face with trying and being upset because she couldn't do it. He had to laugh, and that didn't help things a bit. So he said, Never mind, Murdy. We can't all go into mourning. Well, I don't care, said Myrtle, sniffing. It's not fair. He had to laugh again, and as she didn't see what there was to laugh at, he had to try to console her again. Never mind, Mert, said he. You've got one thing Agnes Kadar has not got. I'd like to know what, said Murdy, jerking at her hair. He waited. Funny, she didn't think of it herself. Why, a father, said he. Oh, said Murdy, the way you do when you don't know what to say. And then, well... Again he waited, then laughed, waited again then turned away. Somebody gave Mrs. Kadara a fireless cooker. Mrs. Doan had no fireless cooker, so she had to stand all day over her hot stove, and this she spoke of often. My supper's in the fireless cooker, Mrs. Kadara would say, and stay out in the cool yard weeding her flower bed. It certainly would be nice to have one of those fireless cookers, Mrs. Doan would say, as she put a meal on the table and wiped her brow with her apron. "'Well, why don't you kill your husband?' Joe Doan would retort. 
Now, if only you didn't have a husband, you could have a fireless cooker. Jovially, he would put the question, which would you rather have, a husband or a fireless cooker? He would argue it out, and he would sometimes get them all to laughing, only the argument was never a very long one. One day it occurred to him that the debates were short because the others didn't hold up their end. He was talking for the fireless cooker. If it was going to be a real debate, they ought to speak up for the husband. But there seemed to be so much less to be said for a husband than there was for a fireless cooker. This struck him as really quite funny, but it seemed it was a joke he had to enjoy by himself. Sometimes when he came home pretty tired, for you could get as tired at odd jobs as at jobs that weren't odd, and heard all about what the Gadars were that night to eat out of their fireless cooker. He would wish that someone else would do the joking. It was kind of tiresome doing it all by yourself, and kind of lonesome. One morning he woke up feeling particularly rested and lively. He was going out to work on the Lily Benny, and he always felt in better spirits when he was working on a boat. It was a cool, fresh, sunny morning. He began a song. He had a way of making up songs. It was, I'd rather be alive than dead. He didn't think of any more lines, so while he was getting into his clothes, he kept singing this one, to a tune which became more and more stirring. He went over to the window by the looking-glass. From this window you looked over to the Kadaras, and then he saw that from the Kadaras a new arrival looked at him. He stared. Then loud and long he laughed. He threw up the window and called out, Hello there! The new arrival made no reply unless a slight droop of the head could be called a reply. "'Well, you capped the climax,' called Joe Doan. Young Doneses had discovered the addition to the Gadara family and came running out of the house. "'Pa!' Edgar called up to him. "'The Kadars have a goat!' "'Well, do you know,' said his father, "'I kind of suspected that was a goat.' Young Kadars came out of the house, to let young Doneses know just what their privileges were to be with the goat and what they weren't. They could walk around and look at her. They were not to lead her by her rope. There's no hope now, said Joe, darkly shaking his head. No man in his senses would buck up against a goat. The little Doneses wouldn't come in and eat their breakfast. They'd rather stay out and walk around the goat. I think it's too bad, their mother sighed. The kitty car and the ball suit and the sailboat were enough for the children to bear. Without this goat, it seems our children haven't got any of the things the Kadars have got. Except, said Joe, and waited for someone to fill it in. But no one did, so he filled it in with a laugh. A rather short laugh. Look out, they don't put you in the fireless cooker, he called to the goat as he went off to work. But he wasn't joking when he came home at noon. He turned in at the front gate, and the goat blocked his passage. The Kadars had been willing to let the goat call upon the Doneses and graze while calling. "'Get out of my way!' called Joan Doan in a surly way, not like Joan Doan. "'Pa!' said young Joe in an awed whisper. "'It's a government goat!' "'What do I care if it is?' retorted his father. "'Damn the government goat!' Everyone fell back, as when blasphemy, as when treason have been uttered. These Portuguese kid looked at him like that, as if they were part of the government and he outside. He was so mad that he bawled at Tony Kadara, To hell with your government goat! From her side of the fence, Mrs. Kadara called, Tony, you bring the goat right home, as one who calls her child and her goat away from evil. And keep her there! finished Joe Doan. The Doneses ate their meal in stricken silence. Finally, Doan burst out. What's the matter with you all? Such a fuss about the order and off of a goat. It's a government goat, lisped Edgar. It's a government goat, repeated his wife in a tense voice. What do you mean, government goat? There's no such animal. But it seemed there was. The Gadars had not only the goat, but a book about the goat. The book was from the government. The government had raised the goat, and had singled the Kadars out as a family upon whom a government goat should be conferred. The Gadars held her in trust for the government. Meanwhile, 
they drank her milk. Tony Kadara said, If I'd dig clams for him this afternoon, he'd let me help milk her tonight, said young Joe. This was too much. Ain't you kids got no spine? Cow town to them Portuguese because a few folks that's sorry for them have made them presents. They're guineas. You're doneses. I want a goat, wailed Edgar. His father got up from the table. The children are all right, said his wife in her patient voice that made you impatient. It's natural for them to want a few things they see other children having. He'd get away. As he went through the shed, he saw his line and picked it up. He'd go out to the breakwater. Maybe he'd get some fish. At least have some peace. The breakwater wasn't very far down the beach from his house. He used to go out there every once in a while. Every once in a while he had a feeling he had to get by himself. It was half a mile long and of big rocks that had big gaps. You had to do some climbing. You could imagine you were in the mountains. And that made you feel far off and different. Only when the tide came in, the sea filled the gaps. And then you had to watch your step. He went way out and turned his back on the town and fished. He wasn't to finish the work on the Lily Benny. They said that morning that they thought they'd have to send down to the Cape for an expert. So he would probably go to work at the new cold storage, working with a lot of Portuguese laborers. He wondered why things were this way with him. They seemed to have just happened so. When you should have had money, it didn't come natural to do the things of people who have no money. The money went out of the bank fishing about three years before his father sold his vessels. During those last three years, Captain Silas Doan had spent all the money he had to keep things going, refusing to believe that the way of handling fish had changed and that the fishing between Cape's End and the Grand Banks would no longer be what it had been. When he sold, he kept one vessel, and the next winter she went ashore right across there on the northeast arm of the Cape. Joe Doan was aboard her that night. Murdy was a baby then. It was of little Murdy that he thought when it seemed the vessel would pound herself to pieces before they could get off. He couldn't be lost. He had to live and work so his little girl could have everything she wanted. After that, the Doneses were without a vessel, and Doneses without a vessel were fish out of sea. They had never been folks to work on another man's boat. He supposed he had never started any big new thing because it had always seemed he was just filling in between trips. A good many years had slipped by, and he was still just putting in time and it began to look as if there wasn't going to be another trip. Suddenly he had to laugh. Some joke on Joe Kadara. He could see him going down the front street, broad, slow, dumb. Why, Joe Kadara thought his family needed him. He thought they got along because he made those trips. But had Joe Kadara ever been able to give his wife a fireless cooker? Had the government presented a goat to the Kadaras when Joe was there? Joe Doan sat out on the breakwater and laughed at the joke on Joe Kadara. When Agnes Kadara was a little girl, she would run to meet her father when he came in from a trip. Joe Doan used to like to see the dash she made, but Agnes was just tickled to death with her mourning. He sat there a long time, sat there until he didn't know whether it was a joke or not. But he got too haddock and more whiting than he wanted to carry home, so he felt better. A man sometimes needed to get off by himself. As he was turning in at home, he saw Ignis Silva about to start out on a trip with Captain Gorsby. Silva thought he had to go. But Silva had been saved. And had his wife a fireless cooker? Suddenly Joe Doan called. Hey, Silva, you're the government goat. The way Doan laughed made Silva know this was a joke, not having a joke of his own, he just turned this one around and sent it back. Government goat yourself. Shouldn't wonder, returned Joe jovially. He had every doan laughing at supper that night. Bear up, bear up. True, you've got a father instead of a goat, but we've all got our cross. We all have our cross to bear. Say, said he after supper, Every woman, every kid puts on a hat, and up we go to see if Ed Smith might happen to have a soda. As they were starting out, he peered over at the Gadaras in mock surprise. 
Why, what's the matter with that goat? That goat don't seem to be taking the Kadars out for a soda. Next day, he started to make a kitty car for Edgar. He promised Joe he'd make him a sailboat. But it was uphill work. The Capes and Summerfolk gave us streets of Baghdad, and the disaster families got the proceeds. Then, when the Summerfolk began to go away, it was quite natural to give them what they didn't want to take with them to a family that had had a disaster. The Doneses had had no disaster. Anyway, the Doneses weren't the kind of people you'd think of giving things to. True, Mr. Done would sometimes come and put on your screen doors for you, but it was as if a neighbor had come in to lend a hand. A man who lives beside the sea and works on the land is not a picturesque figure. Then, in addition to being alive, Joe Doan wasn't Portuguese. So the Kadars got the underwear and the bats and preserves that weren't to be taken back to town. No one father, certainly not a father without a steady job, could hope to compete with all that wouldn't go into the trunks. Anyway, he couldn't possibly make a goat. No wit or no kindness which emanated from him could do for his boys what that goat did for the Kadaras. Joe Doan came to throw an awful hate on the government goat. Portuguese were only Portuguese, yet they had the government goat. Why, there had been Doneses on that cape for more than a hundred years. There had been times when everybody round there worked for the Doneses, but now the closest his boys could come to the government was bedding down the Kadar's government goat. Twenty-five years ago, Kadars had huddled in a hut on the godforsaken Azores. If they knew there was a United States government, all they knew was that there was one. And now it was these Kadara kids were putting on airs to him about the government. He knew there was a joke behind all this, behind his getting so wrought up about it, but he would sit and watch that goat eat leaves in the vacant lot across from the Kadars until the goat wasn't just a goat. It was the turn things had taken. One day, as he was sitting watching Tony Kadar milking his goat, wistful boys standing by, Ignis Silva, just in from a trip, called out, Government goat yourself, and laughed at he knew not what. By God, t'was true, a doan without a vessel, a native who had let himself be crowded out by ignorant upstarts, from a filthy dot in the sea, a man who hadn't got his bearings in the turn things had taken, of a family who had built up a place for other folks to grow fat in. Sure, he was the government goat. By just being alive, he kept his family from all the fancy things they might have if he was dead. Could you be more of a goat than that? Agnes Kadara and Murdy came up the street together. He had a feeling that Murdy was set up because she was walking along with Agnes Kadara. Time had been when Agnes Kadara had hung around in order to go with Murdy. Suddenly he thought of how his wife had said, maybe Agnes Kadara could wear Murdy's shoes. He looked at Agnes Kadara's feet, at Murdy's. Why, Murdy looked like a kid from an orphan asylum, walking along with the daughter of the big man of the town. He got up and started towards town. He wouldn't stand it. He'd show him. He'd buy Murdy. Why, he'd buy Murdy. He put his hand in his pocket. Change from a dollar. The rest of the week's pay had gone to Lou Hibbard for groceries. Well, he could hang it up at Wilkinson's. He'd buy Murdy. He came to a millinery store. There was a lot of black ribbon strewn around in the window. He stood and looked at it. Then he laughed. Just the thing. Cheer up, Mert, said he when he got back home and presented it to her. You could mourn a little, for that matter. You've got a little to mourn about. Murdy took it doubtfully, then wound it round her throat. She liked it, and this made her father laugh. He laughed a long time. It was as if he didn't want to be left without the sound of his laughter. There's nothing so silly as to laugh when there's nothing to laugh at, his wife said finally. Oh, I don't know about that, said Joe Doan. And while it's very nice to make the children presents, in our circumstances it would be better to give them useful presents. But what's so useful as mourning, demanded Doan. Think of all Murdy has got to mourn about. Poor, poor Murdy. 
She's got a father. You can say a thing until you think it's so. You can say a thing until you make other people think it's so. He joked about standing between them and a fireless cooker until he could see them thinking about it. All the time he hated his old job at the cold storage. A doan had no business fish. It was the business of a doan to go out to sea and come home with a full vessel. One day he broke through that old notion that doans didn't work on other men's boats and half in a joke proposed to Captain Cook that he fire a guinea or two and give him a berth on the Elizabeth. And Bill Cook was rattled. Finally he laughed and said, Oh, hi, Joe, you ought to have your own vessel. Which was a way of saying he didn't want him on his. Why didn't he? Did they think because he hadn't made a trip for so long that he wasn't good for one? Did they think a doan couldn't take orders? Well, there weren't many boats he would go on. Most of them in the harbor now were owned by Portuguese. He guessed it wouldn't come natural to him to take orders from a Portuguese. Not at sea. He was taking orders from one now at the cold storage. But as the cold storage wasn't where he belonged, it didn't make so much difference who he took orders from. At the close of that day, Bill Cook told him he ought to be on his own vessel. Joe Doan sat at the top of those steps which led from his house down to the sea, and his thoughts were like the sails coming round the point, slowly, in a procession, and from a long way off. His father's boats used to come round that point the same way. He was lonesome tonight. He felt half like an old man and half like a little boy. Mrs. Kadara was standing over on the platform to the front of her house. She, too, was looking at the sails to the far side of the breakwater, sails coming home. He wondered if she was thinking about Joe Kadara, wishing he was on one of those boats. Did she ever think about Joe Kadara? Did she ever wish he would come home? He'd like to ask her. He'd like to know. When you went away and didn't come home, was all they thought about how'd they get along? And if they were getting along all right, was it true they'd just as soon be without you? He got up. He had a sudden crazy feeling he wanted to fight for Joe Kadara. He wanted to go over there and say to that fireless cooker woman, Trip after trip he made, in the cold and in the storm. He kept you warm and safe here at home. It was for you he went. It was to you he came back. And you'll miss him yet. Think this is going to keep up? Think you're going to interest those rich folks as much next year as you did this? Five years from now, you'll be on your knees with a brush to keep those kids warm and fed. He'd like to get the truth out of her. Somehow things wouldn't seem so rotten if he could know that she sometimes lay in her bed at night and cried for Joe Kadara. It was quiet tonight. All the Kadara children and all the Doneses were out looking for the government goat. The government goat was increasing her range. She seemed to know that being a government goat, she was protected from harm. If a government goat comes in your yard, you're a little slow to fire a tin can at her, not knowing just how treasonous this may be. Nobody in Cape's End knew the exact status of a government goat, and each one hesitated to ask, for the very good reason that the person asked might know, and you would then be exposed as one who knew less than someone else. So the government goat went about where she pleased, and tonight she had pleased to go far. It left the neighborhood quiet, the government goat having many guardians. Joe Doan felt like saying something to Mrs. Kadara, not the rough, wild thing he had wanted to say a moment before, but just say something to her. He and she were the only people around, children all away and his wife upstairs with a headache. He felt lonesome, and he thought she looked that way, standing there against the sea in light that was getting dim. She and Joe Kadara used to sit out on that bulkhead. She moved toward him as if she were lonesome and wanted to speak. On his side of the fence, he moved a little nearer her. She said, My, I hope the goat's not lost. He said nothing. That goat, she's so tame, went on Joe Kadara's wife with pride and affection. She'll follow anybody around like a dog. Joe Doan got up and went in the house. It got so he didn't talk much to anybody. He sometimes had jokes, for he'd laugh, but they were jokes he had all to himself, and his laughing would come as a surprise and make others turn and stare at him. It made him seem off by himself, even when they were all sitting around the table. He laughed at things that weren't things to laugh at, as when Murdy said, 
Agnes Kadara had a letter from Mrs. McCrae and a mourning handkerchief. And after he'd laughed at a little thing like that, which nobody else saw as a thing to laugh at, he'd sit and stare out at the water. Don't be so cheerful, his wife would say. He'd laugh at that. But one day he burst out and said things. It was a Sunday afternoon and the Kadars were going to the cemetery. Every Sunday afternoon they went and took flowers to the stone that said, Lost at Sea. Agnes would call, Come, Tony, we dress now for the cemetery, in a way that made the Doan children feel that they had nothing at all to do. They filed out at the gate, dressed in the best the summer folk had left them, and it seemed as if there were a fair or a circus and all the Doneses had to stay home. This afternoon he didn't know they were going until he saw Murdy at the window. He wondered what she could be looking at, as if she wanted it so much. When he saw, he had to laugh. "'Why, Mert,' said he, "'you can go to the cemetery if you want to. "'There are lots of Doneses there. "'Go on and pay them a visit. "'I'm sure they'd be real glad to see you,' he went on, "'as she stood there doubtfully. "'I doubt if anybody has visited them for a long time. "'You could visit your great-grandfather, Ebenezer Done. "'Wales were so afraid of that man "'that they'd send word round from sea to sea that he was coming. "'And Lucy Done is there, Ebenezer's wife. "'Lucy Done was a woman who took what she wanted.' Maybe the whales were afraid of Ebenezer, but Lucy wasn't. There was a dispute between her and her brother about a quilt of their mother's, and in the dead of night she went into the house and took it off him while he slept. Spunk up! <laughs> Be like the old Dones. Go to the cemetery and wander around from grave to grave while the Kadars are standing by their one stone. My father'd be glad to see you. Why, if he was alive now, if Captain Silas Done was here... He'd let the Kadars know whether they could walk on the sidewalk or whether they were to go in the street. Murdy was interested, but after a moment she turned away. Why, you only go for near relatives, she sighed. He stood, staring at the place where she had been. He laughed, stopped the laugh, stood there staring. You only go for near relatives. Slowly he turned and walked out of the house. The government goat, left home alone, came up to him as if she thought she'd take a walk too. "'Go to hell,' said Joe Doan, and his voice showed that inside he was crying. Head down, he walked along the beach as far as the breakwater. He started out on it, not thinking of what he was doing, so the only thing he could do for Murdy was give her a reason for going to the cemetery. She wanted him in the cemetery." so she'd have some place to go on Sunday afternoons. She could wear black then, all black, not just a ribbon around her neck. Suddenly he stood still. Would she have any black to wear? He thought of a joke, before which all other jokes he had ever thought of were small and sick. Suppose he were to take himself out of the way, and then they didn't get the things they thought they'd have in place of him. He walked on fast, fast and crafty, picking his way along the smaller stones, in between the giant stones, in a fast, sure way he never could have picked had he been thinking of where he went. He went along like a cat who was going to get a mouse, and in him grew this giant joke. Who'd give them a fireless cooker? Would it come into anybody's head to give young Joe Doan a sailboat because his father was dead? They'd rather have a goat than a father. But suppose they were to lose the father and get no goat. Murdy'd be a mourner without any mourning. She'd be ashamed to go to the cemetery. He laughed, so that he found himself down, sitting down on one of the smaller rocks between the giant rocks, and on the side away from town, looking out to sea. He forgot his joke, and knew that he wanted to return to the sea. Doneses belonged at sea. Ashore, things struck you funny— then, after they'd once got to you, hurt. He thought about how he used to come round this point when Murdy was a baby. As he passed this very spot and saw the town lying there in the sun, he'd think about her and how he'd see her now and how she'd kick and crow. But now Murdy wanted to go and visit him in the cemetery. Oh, it was a joke, all right. But he guessed he was tired of jokes, except the one great joke 
the joke that seemed to slap the whole of life right smack in the face. The tide was coming in, in, out, doneses and doneses, in, out, him too, in, out. He was getting wet. He'd have to move up higher. But why move? Perhaps this was as near as he could come to getting back to sea, caught in the breakwater. That was about it, wasn't it? Rocks were queer things. You could wedge yourself in where you couldn't get yourself out. He hardly had to move. If he'd picked a place, he couldn't have picked a better one. Wedge himself in, the tide almost in now, too hard to get out, pounded to pieces like the vessels Doneses had owned. Near as he could come to getting back to sea, near as he deserved to come, him freezing fish with guineas. And there'd be no fireless cooker. He twisted his shoulders to wedge in, where it wouldn't be easy to wedge out. Face turned up, he saw something move on the great flat rock above the jagged rocks. He pulled himself up a little. He rose. He swung up to the big rock above him. On one flat-topped boulder stood Joe Doan. On the other flat-topped boulder stood the government goat. "'Go to hell!' said Joan Doan, and he was sobbing. "'Go to hell!' The government goat nodded her head a little in a way that wagged her beard and shook her bag. Go home, drown yourself, let me be, go away! It was fast and choked and he was shaking. The goat would do none of these things. He sat down, his back to the government goat, and tried to forget that she was there. But there were moments when a goat is not easy to forget. He was willing there should be some joke to his death, like caught in the breakwater, but he wasn't going to die before a goat. After all, He'd amounted to a little more than that. He'd look around to see if perhaps she had started home. But she was always standing right there looking at him. Finally, he jumped up in a fury. What'd you come for? What do you want of me? How do you expect to get home? Between each question, he'd wait for an answer. None came. He picked up a small rock and threw it at the government goat. She jumped, slipped and would have fallen from the boulder if he hadn't caught her hind legs. Having saved her, he yelled, You needn't expect me to save you. Don't expect anything from me. He'd have new gusts of fury at her. What you out here for? Think you was a mountain goat? Don't you know the tide's coming in? Think you can get back easy as you got out? He kicked at her hind legs to make her move on. She stood looking at the water, which covered the in-between rocks on which she had picked her way out. Course, said Joe Doan. Tides in, you fool, you damned goat. With the strength of a man who was full of fury, he picked her up and threw her to the next boulder. Hope you kill yourself, was his heartening word. But the government goat did not kill herself. She only looked round for further help. To get away from her, he had to get her ashore. He guided and lifted, planted forelegs and shoved at hind legs, all the time telling her he hoped she'd kill herself. Once he stood still and looked all around and thought. After that, he gave the government goat a shove that sent her in water above her knees. Then he had to get into and help her to a higher rock. It was after he had thus saved the government goat from the sea, out of which the government goat had cheated him, that he looked ahead to see there were watchers on the shore. Cadarus's had returned from the cemetery. Cadarus's and Doan's were watching him bring home the government goat. From time to time, he looked up at them. There seemed to be no little agitation among this group. They'd hold on to each other and jump up and down like watchers, whose men were being brought in from a wreck. There was one place where again he had to lift the government goat. After this, he heard shouts and looked ashore to see his boys dancing up and down like little Indians. Finally, they had made it. The watchers on the shore came running out to meet them. "'Oh, Mr. Doan!' cried Mrs. Kadara, hands outstretched. I am thankful to you. You saved my goat. I have no man to save my goat. I have no man. I have no man. Mrs. Kadara covered her face with her hands, swayed back and forth, and sobbed because her man was dead. Young Kadars gathered around her. They seemed for a sudden to know they had no father, and to realize that this was a thing to be deplored. Agnes even wet her mourning handkerchief. Murdy came up and took his arm. 
Oh, father, said she, I was so afraid you'd hurt yourself. He looked down into his little girl's face. He realized that just a little before, he had expected never to look into her face again. He looked at the government goat, standing a little apart, benevolently regarding this human kind. Suddenly, Joe Doan began to laugh. He laughed, laughed, and laughed. And it was a laugh. When I saw you lift that goat, said his wife, in the voice of a woman who may not have a fireless cooker, but young Joe Doan, too long browbeaten not to hold the moment of his advantage, began dancing around Tony Gadara with the taunting yell, You ain't got no pa to save your goat. And Edgar lispingly chimed in, Ain't got no pa to save your goat. Here, cried the father, Stop deviling them kids about what they can't help. Come, hats on. Every dome, every Kadara, goes up to see if Ed Smith might happen to have a soda. But young Joe had suffered too long to be quickly silent. You ain't got no pa to get you soda, he persisted. Joe, commanded his father, stop pestering them kids or I'll lick you. And Joe, drunk with the joy of having what the Kadaras had not, shrieked. You ain't got no pa to lick you. You ain't got no pa to lick you. And that's our story for this evening. I hope you enjoyed Government Goat by Susan Glassbell. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.